What's happening? Happy Friday to you and yours. Thanks for joining me. As always, it is very much appreciated. Before I get into the Patriots conversation, I just want to let all of you know, that starting on Monday, we are no longer going to stream to Twitter and Facebook. I don't get credit for the views on YouTube, and that's just not smart business. So moving forward, starting on Monday, we will be on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Pods only. That's after today. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods is where you can find this very podcast Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. live, and of course, on demand at all three of those spots. So let's get to the Pats after that bit of news I had to take care of. Are the Patriots out on one of the most popular quarterbacks in this year's draft? We know the names by now, right? Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, Spencer Rattler, et cetera, et cetera. Are the Patriots out? Are they officially out on one of those quarterbacks I just mentioned? Burt Breer tweeted this week that Elliot Wolf, Alex Van Pelt, quarterbacks coach T.C. McCartney were leading a Patriots contingent to the USC Pro Day. Check out Caleb Williams earlier this week. Then Breer mentioned that Gerard Mayo will join those three and a bigger Patriots group at the Michigan Pro Day, which is today. We found out this morning that Mayo flew into Michigan last night, so the larger contingent is at Michigan today to watch and talk to J.J. McCarthy. That bigger contingent for the Patriots will also be at the LSU Pro Day next week and the North Carolina Pro Day. Next week. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Some of the pro days, if you look at it on the schedule, they actually mirror each other for some of the schools, right? You can't just have one pro day for each school across the country. Doesn't make any sense. So what's interesting here is that North Carolina's pro day is on Thursday. So six days from now, Drake May will have his pro day, and so will Tez Walker and the rest of the Tar Heels. The interesting part to that is also six days from now, Michael Penix will have his pro day along with Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, Jalen McMahon, and everybody else in that Washington program. So Thursday, next Thursday, you have both Michael Penix and Drake May having their pro days. Same day. The Patriots are sending the large contingent of the principal people within the organization to May's Pro Day. Does that tell us that they're out on Michael Penix? I I would be shocked if nobody is at Washington's Pro Day, of course, when you look at all of the names I mentioned just a moment ago, right? They will have somebody there. They'll have a wide receivers coach there. They might have an offensive line coach there because of Rosengarten. But if you look at Washington's roster, they have a lot of guys who are going to get picked in the top three or four rounds of this draft. So I would be stunned if the Patriots have zero representation at Washington's Pro Day next Thursday. But I do think this tells us that the Patriots, as an organization, they have very, very tepid interest in Michael Penix. I don't think they see him as one of the guys that they have to go out and draft in late April. I don't think they feel that urgency. I don't think they love Michael Penix. And the reason why I don't think they love Penix, it's rather obvious if you go off of what we know. Penix was the only guy, when you look at the top four or five quarterbacks, he was the only guy that the Patriots did not meet up with at the Combine. Penix mentioned that. Penix did not meet with the Patriots at the Combine in February. You also look at this fact that they're sending the most important people when it comes to evaluating the quarterback position, they're sending all of those people, including the GM and the head coach, to North Kakalaka instead of Washington to check out Penix. What's that tell you? If they think that they have to send the most important people to North Carolina to watch Drake May and not do the same with Penix, and of course, you can't have everybody go, right? They're having it on the same day. But 
You could absolutely split the baby, so to speak. You can have Gerard Mayo, Elliot Wolf go to Drake May's pro day, and you could have Alex Van Pelt, T.C. McCartney, and Ben McAdoo go to Michael Penix's pro day. There's a reason why every single solitary person that's going to have a big voice in the decision as far as who's going to be the future quarterback of this franchise is going to North Carolina and not flying across the country to check out Washington. So no meeting at the at the combine. Nobody of really significance that we know of is going across the country to, to meet with Penix. And yes, I know that they had him at the Senior Bowl and they could have had conversations at the Senior Bowl. But the Senior Bowl is at the very beginning of the process. Now, does it mean they're not going to have a conversation with Penix? Of course not. They could have a top 30 visit with Penix. He could come to Foxborough. They could put him through the drills. They could do all of that. But I don't think there's any question. The fact that they have all of the main principals going to watch Drake May, I don't think that has, you know, that, that leaves no question to me that they are first and foremost looking at Drake May and then clearly it's Michael Penix. And some of some might say that's that's obvious, but look, the team didn't have to go out of their way to have a conversation with, with Penix at the combine. They could have easily had that conversation. So, you know, when you look at this, I, I do believe it tells us. Again, I'm not telling you there's there's no interest, but I believe there is that tepid interest in Penix in drafting that guy. I think Elliot Wolf, by his actions and through the reports and the leaks, if the Patriots, they want a quarterback in this draft, and we all think they want a quarterback in this draft, they might not have made the ultimate decision yet, but they are strongly leaning towards Drake May and Jaden Daniels. And even J.J. McCarthy, because they're going to his pro day today. So I think we could look at Penix as a possibility. You don't want to rule everybody out. But I think Penix is least likely out of the top four or five guys due to what we've seen from Wolf, Mayo, and company and how they have handled this process early on. They are putting more eggs in the Drake May, Jaden Daniels basket than they are in the Michael Penix basket. All right, before we move on, I got more thoughts. Don't forget to like, subscribe. Of course, more likes means more eyeballs. We need to continue to build this momentum. Every single thumbs up at YouTube means the world to us. It continues to expand our reach in the brand, so don't forget to give us that thumbs up. And I checked this morning. We're about 300 subscriptions away from hitting our April 8th goal of 3,000, so let's continue to push for that. And, of course, as I said, we're not going to go live on Twitter and Facebook starting on Monday. Everything is going to be YouTube, 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 On Demand, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Pods. So right now is the time to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you make sure you are reminded every time we have a pod at 11 a.m. Monday through Friday right here on the Nick Cattle Show. Rate and review Apple Pods, Spotify. I see your comments at Spotify. I appreciate those as well. So why is the interest tepid? Let's say the interest is tepid. Wolf, Mayo, Van Pelt, McCartney, McAdoo. Why would they be sort of kind of interested in Penix, but seemingly not nearly as interested in him as the quarterbacks that we could see go in the top four or five picks of this year's draft? I have to wonder if, if one thing is the injuries. And I know it was reported by Ian Rappaport and others, that Penix passed the physicals, right? He got a clean bill of health. But here's the thing with a clean bill of health. You get a clean hill of be uh, a bill of health on that day, right? So you could get a clean bill during combine week. Obviously, that doesn't guarantee that the injuries that you've had in the past will not creep up again at some point down the road. And you're already dealing with things that you've had damaged on your body. So right now, in this moment, you could be okay to go out there and throw a football. But how much damage has been done? It might not rule you out from an NFL career, but the Patriots and other teams might look at Penix and say, those are still red flags. I still don't want to draft a guy who's had two ACL tears and two significant shoulder injuries. So I think the injuries have to be part of this conversation, even though he got that clean bill of health at the Combine. 
I also look at Penix, and I see a guy who has a limited ceiling. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, and I'm not telling you I don't like Penix. I do like Penix. But when I look at Michael Penix, I feel like we know what he is. And that's not always a bad thing. You have some kind of certainty when it comes to Penix versus some of the other quarterbacks in this draft. But I think what we saw from Penix at Washington, that is what he's going to be. I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot more to get out of him. Again, could be fine, could be a franchise quarterback. But what you see is what you get with Penix. I, I feel like, you know, he, he's not necessarily great off platform. He, he is not a supreme athlete. He's got better athleticism than people think, but he doesn't have the athleticism of any of the top four guys at that position in this draft. He just doesn't. So if you're looking at Penix as a prospect, you say, what we saw at Washington is pretty much the best version of Penix that you're going to get. Now, some teams might also look at Penix, and I think this is a weaker argument because Jaden Daniels and what he had at LSU, we can't overlook the fact that Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. were at LSU. But Penix also had Polk, McMillan, and of course, Adunze. And so a lot of people might look at that and say, yeah, what we saw from Penix at Washington is his ceiling, but it is his ceiling with three wide receivers that are likely going to go in the top three or four rounds. And one guy who many believe is just a tick below Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors on their boards at that position. So when you're looking at Penix, again, you can love him if you'd like, but when you look at him, you see what he is. And I don't think people in the NFL are looking at Penix saying to themselves, he has so much room to grow. It's more of, he is who he is. You either love it or you don't. You either pick him or you don't off of what you saw. And so the question for teams like the Patriots at the top of the draft, and specifically the Pats, and I think eventually Minnesota, because I do think Minnesota is going to end up moving into the top five. Ultimately, the question is for those teams, do you want to take the guy who you look at and say to yourself, okay, Drake May is full of potential and there are some risks. There are always risks when you draft a guy in the top three at that position. There are the risks, but the ceiling is so damn high. And if he can fulfill that potential, we feel like we have a game-changing impact player at that position for the next 10 to 15 years. Is that the guy you want to take? Do you want to take somebody like a Drake May or a Jaden Daniels that you say they can grow, even though Daniels is older than May? You say, well, they still have more to give, but they do bring some risk. And we've talked about some of those risks in prior podcasts. Do you draft a guy like that, or do you wait later on and draft the more sure thing, quote-unquote, like Michael Penix, who also has weaknesses but might be a bit safer to pick in the second round? Or do you take the late lotto ticket, like a Joe Milton from Tennessee? Do you take a Spencer Rattler in the third or fourth round? So those are the conversations that are happening with the Patriots right now. And I think just, just looking at what we know right now, we don't know what we don't know. I can only tell you what's been reported and what we know right now. What we know right now, it certainly feels like Patriots are going quarterback at three. And it certainly feels like it's going to be May or Daniels or maybe even McCarthy. Now, I'm hesitant on McCarthy. I would be just fine with Daniels or May. And the reason why, I think we don't even at this point necessarily have to read any tea leaves. We just look at, again, what we know. What do we know? What have we been told? We have been told that at the combine, coming out of that combine, the Patriots liked all three guys at the top. They would not have an issue drafting any one of the three guys. We know at the combine that the Patriots were reportedly impressed by May. We know the Patriots went out and signed Jacoby Brissett. Not only did they sign a quarterback like Brissett, but they signed a quarterback like Brissett to a one-year deal. And I'll keep hammering that point home. They signed a quarterback. The only quarterbacks they had 
on the roster were Rourke and Zappi. And if you're a team that is not focused at drafting a quarterback in the first round, I think you would give Jacoby Brissett at least a two-year deal to give yourself that extra year of the window, right? A little bit more security. The fact they gave Brissett a one-year contract tells me that the focus right now on March 22nd is to draft that guy at three because there's no way you're drafting somebody at three at that position and he's not playing, you know, by 2025. So the combine talk, the Brissett term to the contract, the fact that the Patriots are, are sending such a large contingent, including Gerard Mayo, which I do think is important. They're sending a large contingent to LSU and UNC's pro days. That, to me, tips the scales that the Patriots are picking a quarterback at three. Now, they might be running the ultimate okey-doke, but they're investing a lot of time into the top three quarterbacks, specifically Daniels and May. And I don't think they're investing this much time and that much stuff has been leaked about how much they like the idea of one of Daniels or May. I don't think we're getting all of that unless they have significant interest in them. Of course, as I just said, they could be running the okie doke and it would be one hell of a smoke screen and one hell of an okie doke run by this front office. But it could be. By the way, as we're talking about uh, the pro days, Burt Breer just posted that J.J. McCarthy's script will start with staple throws from the Michigan offense, then go to throws from the offenses of teams looking at him with cut-it-loose throws to finish. That's according to the quarterback's coach at Michigan, John Beck. And they're apparently adjusting a bit after a teammate tweaked a hammy in the 40-yard dash. So J.J. McCarthy will, during his script, run plays from the Michigan offense. Then he will move on to plays from the Patriots offense, from the commander's offense. I would imagine the uh, Giants offense. And that's how that pro day will go. Also, one more note about McCarthy's pro day, which is interesting. This might have changed over the past hour or two, but the last I saw, the last I saw, there wasn't really a, a big time presence from the Vikings at McCarthy's pro day today. Now, of course, that could be smokescreen, that could be okie doke, that could be playing games, but I do think it's interesting that the Vikings, who had the you know the 11 pick and 23rd pick after that trade last week, everybody's talking about them moving up and drafting a quarterback. I do find it kind of curious if this remains the case. Again, this was as of this morning. Things can change. But I do find it curious that after that trade, the Vikings are not at J.J. McCarthy's pro day with a big-time contingent like the Patriots have. That's interesting to me. Very interesting. And Drew F. jumps in, and I understand this, Drew. They met with J.J. already. I get that. A lot of teams have met with the quarterbacks already. But you meet with these guys as much as possible, and you you go out to dinner with them, you do Zooms with them, you have the facility visits with them, you go to their pro days, every bit of information. If you are interested in drafting a guy, especially if you're interested in trading up to draft that guy, you usually spend an inordinate amount of time on that quarterback. So just meeting him once doesn't mean like, all right, we're done. We got it in the books. We met him. We got our notes. We're good to go. That's not usually how it works. And you also think about, you know, Minnesota, they have the McCown connection, McCown, you know, he, it's just, it's, it's very interesting. Very, very interesting that they made that deal. They, as in the Vikings, they made that deal and they're not at McCarthy's pro day with a bunch of people. Interesting to me, especially, again, with the McCown connection. Of course, he has a connection with Drake May from high school days. So are the Vikings looking at Drake May as that guy? And if they are, do the Vikings think that Drake May is going to fall to four? Or are we talking about a possible deal with the Patriots 
And the Patriots move out of three. It's just all very interesting that the Vikings aren't there. Okay, before we continue, I remind you, starting on Monday, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods only. We will not be streaming to Twitter or Facebook. I don't get credit for those views, which means I don't make money. I'm trying to survive here as a one-man band. So we're going to kick everything to YouTube starting on Monday. YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods. It just doesn't make business sense for me to continue to you know, stream to other platforms that aren't going to help me out financially. So we're going to start that on Monday. Also, don't forget while you're here, give us that thumbs up. Let's build a crowd during the pod today on a Friday before I go out and enjoy myself for some March Madness with the wife. And boy, am I going to enjoy myself. But give us that thumbs up. More thumbs means more eyeballs. Don't forget to subscribe. Trying to hit 3,000 subscriptions by April 8th. We can do that with your help. Rate and review. And the Patreon page. Going to drop the mailbag answers in a little while. Patreon page, five bucks a month, exclusive content. We're going to go. We're going to go with some post-game Celtics Bruins coverage on that Patreon channel during the playoffs. We're going to do some of that. And we're also going to have some fun times with the draft at the Patreon, patreon.com slash Nick Cattle, C-A-T-T-L-E-S, buck and a quarter a week. All right, so the other thing I wanted to talk about today was the approach with the quarterback if you do draft that quarterback at number three. If you pick May or Daniels or McCarthy, if you pick that guy, you have three options on how to handle the quarterback. The first option is you start him week one. He's your guy. You drafted him at three. You don't draft a guy at three unless you believe that he can start week one. You throw him out there. You throw him in the deep end of the pool, and you say, let's see if this young man can swim or not. Teams have done that. Peyton Manning had to do that. Uh, Andrew Luck, of course, was thrown into the deep end right away. So teams have done that. Josh Allen in Buffalo was thrown in the deep end, even though he was coming off of the Wyoming numbers, were, which weren't necessarily fantastic. So the one option, first option you got out of three, is you just play the guy week one. You draft Drake May, he's your starting quarterback week one. Another option you have is that you can sit the guy that you pick at three, at least for some of the season. You don't start him week one. You don't necessarily say, we're going to just put this guy on the bench in mothballs, and we'll see him in 2025. We're going to sit him. We're going to see how he develops during the season. And then that's that. The third thing that they can do is obviously sit the quarterback for the entire year. And I wonder how you guys feel about that. Right now, where do you kind of sit? Do you sit on this? Hey, you you picked him at three. You play him week one. Do you think you kind of slow play it and not necessarily say to yourself, we're going to start him week one? We don't love that idea, but we're not really going to sit here and just rule him out for 2024. Or do you like the idea of just sitting that guy for the entire season and letting him slow cook, so to speak? Now, if if it were me, I got to tell you, I am 100% fine sitting the quarterback for the entire season if that's what you think you need to do. If the Patriots look at Drake May, we've heard a lot about Drake May, right? We know the weaknesses. We know some of the flaws, the mechanics, right? The elongated release, the footwork, the drifting in the pocket towards throws, right? We know all of that stuff. Sometimes he'll miss easy plays in front of him. We've heard all of the same weaknesses and flaws. If I'm drafting Drake May, if I'm Van Pelt and McAdoo and Wolf and Mayo, and I feel like, hey, we could draft Drake May, but May's not going to be ready right away. We need to work with him. We need to develop him. We need to work on the mechanics. We need to straighten out the footwork. We need to make sure that he stops drifting in the pocket. We've got to develop this guy the right way, and the right way is to sit him for a full season. If that's what they think, then I'm fine with it. I have absolutely no problem with sitting the guy for the entire season if I think in the long run it's going to make that guy better. Bucky Brooks at Fox Sports actually wrote a very interesting column over the last week or so about quarterback trends 
from top 10 quarterbacks, guys that were drafted in that, in that top 10 of the draft. Here's what Brooks wrote in part. Since 2011, 28 quarterbacks have been selected within the first 10. That compares to just 20 quarterbacks from 98 to 2010. Though the hit rate hovers around 40% for each group, there are some interesting trends evaluators can take from the data. Teams valuing experience from top quarterback prospects were more, more likely to nail the pick, particularly during the pre-rookie pool era, which is 98 to 2010. Since 2011, the experience factor stands out when looking for the common denominator for the stars of each group. So, Bucky Brooks says, when you look at quarterbacks taken in the top 10, since 2011, there have been 28 quarterbacks taken in the top 10. Prior to that, from 98 to 2010, there were 20 guys taken in the top 10. And if you look at the quarterbacks since 2011 that were taken in that region, experience is a common denominator that separates the guys that were taken in the top 10 at that position that became stars and everybody else. Brooks writes, with the recipe seemingly established for drafting and developing franchise quarterbacks, from yesteryear, you would think more teams would follow the plan in the new era. However, that has not been the case. So even though the data tells us that the more experienced college quarterbacks have a, a, more, like, a more likely result of being a star at the NFL level if they're picked in the top 10, even though, even though that's what the data tells us, Brooks says a lot of teams have actually zigged when you should zag. Teams have thrown caution to the wind while selecting more inexperienced players and rushing them onto the field. During the new era, six quarterbacks were selected within the top 10 with fewer than 20 collegiate starts. And 18 quarterbacks were drafted with fewer than 30 starts on their resumes. The odds of selecting a star are significantly lower when drafting an inexperienced player. Brooks writes, fast forward to the 2024 class. Daniels, Jaden Daniels, leads the group with 55 combined starts. Caleb Williams checks in with 33 starts. May and McCarthy enter the league with 26 and 28 starts, respectively. So when you look at the data, when you draft a guy who is as inexperienced as Drake May or J.J. McCarthy, if you draft that guy and you play him right away, it usually doesn't end up great. Usually doesn't end up well for you. So when I'm looking at the data, I'm thinking, if I love May's potential, I love his ceiling, sitting him might be the best pathway to ultimately get that guy to be a star. And, and that is that is absolutely, no doubt, the number one priority, isn't it? The number one priority of drafting anybody at number three at that position is not, oh, we can win games in 2024. Oh, let's start them right away and see if we can get to the playoffs in 2024. The very reason you're drafting that guy at three is because you think he can be the future franchise. You believe that he can be the guy for the next 10 to 15 years. To me, waiting one year isn't the end of the world. If you wait one year and it makes it more likely that you hit on the pick and Drake May or J.J. McCarthy or Jaden Daniels ends up being a much better quarterback in 2025 and beyond, that's the point, folks. That's the point. And I know people will say, well, why would you pick a guy at number three if you're not going to play him in 2024? Well, I just gave you one answer. Another answer is this. You don't know what's going to be out there in 2025. And if you feel like you've got a franchise quarterback that you can pick at number three, then you're not going to kick the can down the road in 2025. Wouldn't you rather have somebody who you drafted and developed and believed in ready for 2025 versus doing this all over again and hoping with your fingers crossed that you can land a quarterback in the first place and then that quarterback is somebody who can take over right away 
or do you want to draft somebody in 2025 who might not be ready? And now we're talking about 2026 when your franchise quarterback starts. If May and McCarthy, if those guys need to sit, if May or McCarthy, if they're the guy and they need to sit for a period of time, sit them. You got to work on May's footwork and his mechanics, sit them. McCarthy did not have a ton put on his plate at Michigan. He doesn't have a ton of starts at the collegiate level, as I just mentioned. If you feel like he's going to be better off in the long run by sitting him for a bit or sitting him for the year, then you do it. The long-term success at that position is priority number one. Here's one more note. I was thinking about this during the week. If you are going to play the guy right away, if you're drafting Drake May at three and you are going to play him right away, and really any quarterback, if you're drafting somebody at three and you're playing that guy right away, I like the veteran wide receiver idea. You know, some people might say, Nick, why would you trade 34 for a veteran receiver when you could just get a receiver at 34? I just like the idea of getting somebody that is a veteran wide receiver one versus somebody who is walking into the league and may become a wide receiver number one. Because in recent history, when I look across the league, that recipe has worked. The recipe of bringing in a veteran wide receiver one with a young quarterback has worked. Josh Allen wasn't Josh Allen until Buffalo traded for Stephon Diggs. Tyreek Hill did this twice. In Kansas City, Hill was walking into his third season when Mahomes became the full-time starter. Of course, Hill gets traded to Miami to help the young quarterback and Tua Tungavailoa. Justin Herbert with the Chargers, had Keenan Allen when he got there. You can look at some instances when a team drafted a quarterback and a receiver, and both guys flourished, they developed, and it worked. Cincinnati would be at the top of the list with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. And, of course, at number two would be T. Higgins. But I have seen that model. I have seen the model of young quarterback with steady veteran wide receiver one. And I have seen those wide receivers make an impact directly on the level of play with that young quarterback. That's what I've seen. That's what I've seen. All right, before I get to some of your chats and some of your thoughts, don't forget to give us that thumbs up. More likes means more eyeballs. Let's continue to build this community. Come on in. We welcome you with wide open arms. The beer's cold. Beverages are cold. Whatever you drink. Water's warm. Join the party. You're invited. Always invited. Don't forget to give us that thumbs up. Subscribe as well. As of Monday, we're not going to be streaming to Twitter or Facebook. We're going to be YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Pods. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. This is where we're building it now, YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. You can even click that little notify bell so you know exactly when we're going live, Monday through Friday, 11 a.m., Rate and review Spotify, Apple Pods, and Patreon. Patreon page, we did a Discord chat earlier this week. We are doing the mailbag later today. I dropped an exclusive, exclusive ad-free podcast on Wednesday night about the very latest regarding wide receivers and the Patriots and what's being said. We will have Celtics and Bruins playoff post-game coverage Select games there at the exclusive Patreon page. Five bucks a month, buck and a quarter a week. Patreon.com slash Nick Cattle, C-A-T-T-L-E-S. All right, let me jump through some of these uh, comments. It's difficult. I don't have a producer, of course. This is just me. So I'm, I'm going to run through some of the comments. Let's go to DJ Daniel. I think Penix could improve athletically in the NFL. He becomes more removed from the injuries and his body feels better. Maybe. I, I think Penix is a better athlete than people give him credit for. However, I, I would also say, DJ, it needs to be a part of that player's instinct, right? It, it needs to be a part of his bag, so to speak. Now, Penix could become better athletically in the NFL, but is he comfortable with plays when they're off platform? You know, we just saw somebody in Mac Jones who wasn't necessarily great off platform, right? So 
do you feel comfortable doing it? Having the ability to move around is one thing, but having the, the comfort level in doing it, because if you're not comfortable and you're trying to create plays off schedule, that's when mistakes happen. Jump to a super chat. Casey Reed jumping on again from SoCal to drop the super chat for a fellow roadie alum. We'll watch at lunch. Congrats on all the success. Thank you, Casey. I appreciate that, my man, all the way out in Southern California. Hopefully you enjoy this podcast when you catch it at lunch. Uh, and Rody, you are right. They got to figure out the basketball program, man. They got the Miller's not doing a great job. Everybody fleed the program before this season. They had a bad year. He's on watch. He's on watch right now to me. But again, thank you, Casey, for the super chat. Patriots Loco. McCarthy could be the guy if they trade back. Alex Barth did a fantastic job writing about teams that have traded back for quarterbacks. And I'll just give you the gist. It hasn't worked out. <laughs> it, it, is, it has not worked out for those teams. Usually when you trade back for a quarterback, it's a disastrous decision. Trading up works a lot. Trading up for Josh Allen, trading up for Patrick Mahomes, trading up for Lamar Jackson like the Ravens did back into the first round. Those things tend to work out. So uh, I, I get a little queasy about the idea of trading down and landing your quarterback. I think if you love the quarterback, take the quarterback. If you're trading down, then you're admitting that you don't love the quarterback inherently because you're opening up the opportunity for other teams to leapfrog you and take the guy you want. Let's say the Patriots like J.J. McCarthy. They make a trade with the Chargers. Right? They move down to five. What happens if McCarthy goes four? What if they trade down to the Giants and they say, well, we like McCarthy and we like May and we think we're going to get one of those guys, so we're fine with moving down a little bit. What happens if those guys go at four and five? If you like the guy, take the guy. I, I, I just, if you're moving down, I think you're, you're, you're almost thinking too much about it. You're thinking too hard. Val says we need more picks more than anything else right now. See, you do need picks. You do need to address several holes on this team as we've talked about. But man, you got to get the quarterback. I've said this before. I'll say it again, and I'll continue to say this until late April. If you believe a franchise quarterback is sitting there at three, then you take the quarterback. I couldn't care less what else you need. I couldn't care less how many needs that you have. You have only so many swings and so many opportunities to land a quarterback in the top three. And if you're taking him at three, you think he can be special. You just don't find those guys on the regular. Yes, you can find them in the late first round. You can find them in the second round and the fifth round. But it's much more likely that you hit on a quarterback in the first round. It, it just is. So if you think that guy can be the guy, then you take him. You find other ways to address tackle and wide receiver. I'm not messing around. If I think I can get a franchise-altering quarterback, I'm picking that dude. I'm not thinking twice. That's what I'm doing. You know what else I'm doing? I'm heading out for March Madness. Going to enjoy myself on this weekend. You enjoy yourself as well. Have fun. Stay healthy. Be responsible. But enjoy yourself. If something breaks, if I'm not at the bar watching March Madness, then I will jump on here if it's significant, and we will break the news as we always do. If I'm out, don't hold a grudge against me. Don't judge me. Life's also about fun. <laughs> so uh, we'll break it if I'm here to break it. If not, back on Monday, 11 a.m., Monday through Friday, 11 a.m., every day, starting Monday again. Remember, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Pods only. Facebook, gone. Twitter, gone. All traffic to YouTube. If you're a fan of this podcast, you enjoy watching it and listening to it, you enjoy the alternate universe that I think we provide to a lot of the coverage out there, then make sure you like this podcast on YouTube. Make sure that you also subscribe to the podcast as we try to hit 3,000 subscriptions by April 8th. We can do it. We're about 300 away, but we need all of your help. Rate, review on Spotify, 
Check out the Patreon if you want exclusive content. Again, have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday unless something big breaks, and I'm actually here to break it. It's the